conjure an image of a regular Filipino. When I do, I remember farmers, drivers, factory workers, women in sweatshops, squatters, corporate workers living in substandard, inhumane, cramped apartments, domestic helpers, nurses, mom. I was born in a transnational family. As a child, I had no inkling about the womb with which I came from. I bore the arduous task of talking with digital parents whose faces were caged on the desktop. There were no means of legitimizing a relationship except that our last names were similar. I bore no understanding as to why boxes plastered with LBC were delivered semi-annually. There was emptiness. But who knew that parcels of happiness can be compartmentalized, crystallized, and physicalized by gadgets, by gifts in Farmville, by the amazement that mom was level 140 plus. As I matured in the society, it was impressed in me that the reason why the Philippines is not progressing is because of our laziness. We often blame tambais and patronize them by insinuating that they find work. We often blame them not to drink, but what if alcohol is their concoction to wait for dignifying work, to pass time? But the system has failed and they have been kept hanging. What if they are afraid to loan their souls to foreigners who view themselves as monarchs in their homes? In this painting, I only wanted to portray three things. In a textual manner, I wanted to portray genetics, climate change, and the anomaly that it has wrought upon humans through a still life style of painting. On a contextual manner, I wanted to critique the internalized notions of Filipino laziness. I also wanted to incorporate themes of Western imperialism through figurative devices. I used Wantaman's narrative as a background of the story, Atlas as a metaphor of the global south, and apples as a representation for the global north. In the story of Wantamad, he saw the fruitful Bayabas tree, and instead of picking its fruits, he laid amongst its shades with his mouth wide open. Because of the churning winds that fleeted and caressed him, he fell asleep and woke up to the juice of the bayabas being pecked and munched by birds. He went home hungry. If there is any semblance in this story with the regular Filipinos, it is often the last sentence. We come home, sometimes we can't, but we come home hungry. We hear in the stories of Wantama the horrors of laziness, of stability, and how comical it is for him to be deprived because he never sought self-betterment. Why do we hear these narratives? Why are there stories that has told Filipinos not to be lazy? And why has such stories sprung after the 1900s, after being forced to partake in an orgy of colonialism? Maybe we were so economically depressed post-war then that we became so reliant on stories that police are being earnest, are being hardworking. But if this is true, wouldn't you agree that it had mutated into something cruel, dehumanizing, and with the way we abscond the last shreds of our dignity just for the quarta? Another story that took me was Western in nature. I was allured with a narrative about Atlas, the god doomed to carry the weights of the heavens. In contextualizing his narrative, in a way, I wanted to also reclaim our artistic and poetic space. 
His is a narrative that resonates with the Filipinos. We are forced into situations. When I review this, we're not lazy people. We're not lazy people who cannot socially mobilize. We're not people with no aspirations, who simply waits for the apple, the bounty, or any blessing to fall on our mouth, more so our laps. We grab it. We seize it. We struggle for it. We carry it. And we carry the hopes that someday all of it will pay off. And sometimes, it is to no avail. I titled this piece Wantamad and dictated how it should be translated into English in order to reclaim the proper adjectives to the struggle. Wantamad directly translates to Lazy John, but we're not lazy. I use the word immovable to provide nuance and ambivalence to its implied meaning. Immovable in terms of our position, how we've been caught in a gridlock. Immovable in terms of our principles for liberty and collective desire for emancipation. It modifies the structure in the painting as an entity that is firm, grounded, and a person who controls his will. In merging the narratives of both, the only nuance needed was to provide what fruit could be representative of the West, and I settled for apples. You know, if I were to substitute an item for the letter A in the Roman alphabet as taught in Philippine schools, it would be atis or sugar apple, something which is readily accessible and something which grows in my backyard. Instead, we have apples for letter A. There are no apple trees in the Philippines. In fact, all of it are imported from the global north, and it represents the pinnacle of neocolonialism by making us believe that it is genuinely ours. How do we relate with fruits called Fuji apples when some common Filipinos don't even know where Fuji is? In conceptualizing apples, I also wanted to serve a sense of ambivalence. I shall draw this from the Bible. Fruits have precipitated the original sin to humankind since time immemorial. We could be walking right now in the Garden of Eden, but we have been caught up in an oppressive cycle so intricately engineered by our evils. Now that there are assimilated cultures like apples that are so ingrained in the status quo, how do we revisit and extract it from the way we live? Or will we live our lives knowing that we carry, that we carry it unwantedly? We get to observe the superficial horrors of genetic modifications through the oversized apples which scale the size of a titan. It represents the recurring thirst of the global north to experiment on genetics, food, and even animals if you know Okja. It's their grappling attempt to survive in environmental destruction that they purport to be non-existent. Well, to first lay the point of this painting, I point to the detrimental effects of change. Change in here and there is good. But GMOs are practices which are complicit and imminent to climate change which was resulting and we're experiencing climate catastrophes and Pacific genocide. There were other elements that I would like to explain. Akin to the story of Juan Tamad, I wanted to replicate the drippings of the bayabas through the paint drips. It does resemble blood, but it can also mean how juicy the prospect and the bountiful resources exploited by the global north. The global south is provided with drips of resources for it to be alive, to sustain its slave-like function in the world system. At the same time, this providence of resources 
and the need for the global north to be carried represents its interdependence, lest the heavens ergo fruit shatter. The blood-like drips represent the determination to liberate oneself until a cunning point where blood and martyrdom, although unwanted, will forever etch the inspiration for the liberation of the global masses of us. I used a brown undertone for the background, which was thereafter laid with white and blue to signify the peace purported by the status quo. It also represents the heavens. This is also strategic to emphasize how contrasting the paint drips were, which provides a quality of discomfort for some viewers. To effectively represent and extrapolate the situation of Atlas as one, I picked lighter tones for the skin for two reasons. First is to pronounce the darkness in some areas, and second is to convey that the global south has been in the situation until the tipping point where melanin starts to dissipate from old age. I made sure that brush strokes were not smooth and convey the quality that makes it unfinished. Had it been a clear picture and it followed the convention of Western arts, it would have implied that I was immortalizing the image of the Filipino that is struggling. It was simply my way of saying that there is an unfinished work and the agenda of the global south and the global masses is not ending. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. This would have been an alternate title of this painting. I also wanted to allude or pay homage to the global professional and technical workforce who are forced to render labor abroad because of better working conditions and better salaries, just like my parents when I was born. Imagine if there was dignifying and sufficient work here. Imagine if all the jobs we had were never impeded, never in intervened with by our colonizers. There would not be any reasons for families to be torn for grueling years, grueling decades, even lifetimes. As our world grapples with the pandemic today, this issue remains pronounced as our healthcare workers become squeezed thin. The global south is dying, and yet we are still obliged to carry the hegemonic belief to respect what we have to serve America. After all these, I wonder, who are the real lazy people? It's not one, 